Hey guys, welcome to today's show. On today's show, I'm going to be in conversation with a guy called Jason Pfeiffer, who is the editor-in-chief of the American-based Entrepreneur Magazine. And we chatted together about his creative process in approaching an entrepreneurial life and mindset, what he believes are the ingredients of an entrepreneur and how to spot one and become one, and also his interview with The Rock. Yes, The Rock and uh, what he learned from that interview and uh, other great people he's interviewed. It is a fantastic interview. He's a very smart guy. You're going to love it. Don't forget to leave a review and a comment. I love reading them. Tag me into them and subscribe if you don't already. I'd love you to do that. All right. Enjoy. Thank you. Um, hidden blessings of the pandemic, my friend, because everybody has a different framing of what's going on. I know entrepreneurially wired people usually frame things like this with more of an opportunity head on than a tragedy head on what mm -hmm. has been your framing any hidden blessings of the pandemic oh i think so many you know if you look back at the history of terrible events uh which yeah. of course the you know history contains many of them what you see despite you know let's not dismiss the terrible tragedies that befall many people. But what you see coming out of it is actually great innovation, great opportunity, great change, and an openness to new ideas that just didn't exist before. And a lot of the world that we live in is courtesy of some past terrible thing. If you live in a city and you, and you enjoy the park in your city, I live in New York and Central Park is an amazing place. You have the cholera epidemics of the mid 1800s to thank for that. Um, you rewind to the uh, to the black the bubonic plague of the 1300s, and that created the the employment contract as we know it, the, the kind of foundation of our economy. And so. When I looked at this moment, I said, okay, well, here's what's going to happen. Um, people used to resist change, and now they're going to understand that all ideas have to be on the table, and that the things that they thought were maybe too cumbersome or maybe too ridiculous are now things that uh, might really be worth taking seriously. Also, barriers are going to fall. Barriers, not just in consumer interest, but also barriers in regulation. I mean, like the number of regulations that have fallen um, that didn't make any sense to begin with uh, are tremendous. Uh, you know, now I can or I can walk up to a restaurant and walk away with a cocktail down the street. I couldn't do that before. Why couldn't I do that before? There's absolutely no good reason I couldn't have done that before. But now I can, and let's try to keep that. And so I think that if you're an entrepreneur and you see this as an opportunity and you try to seek out where people are going and how you can be a problem solver and a solution offerer to people, then the, the, the possibilities are absolutely endless. I love that response. I think people are moving towards you know, um, a stability or let's weather the storm or a resilience, let's get better in spite of the storm. I'm not surprised at your answer coming from what I've seen of you in the way you're wired entrepreneurially, but I still think that that is a rare exceptional mindset. And I think that's probably been true generationally, don't you? The minority of people think like you think. Yeah, probably. Um... Uh, you know, I mean, the, sure, the minority of the minority of people are entrepreneurs. Um, the you know, the minority of people are the genuine change makers. I mean, yeah. you know, if everybody was Thomas Edison, then we wouldn't know Thomas Edison's name. Uh, but um, but if you are wired that way, if that's the way that you think and see the world, then I think that there are amazing opportunities ahead for you. And you know, if if that's if that's not the way that you see the world, then I. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sure there, there are plenty of other ways to, to, to find comfort and find value um, and provide value uh, in the world. But, you know, the folks that I'm generally speaking to are the ones who you don't need to make the argument. Um, you just need to give them the inspiration to keep going. I'm interested in your mention of Thomas Edison because I saw in one of your Instagram posts about your writer's block on your 8,000 word script. And yeah. you broke the writer's block by having a popsicle break and then went With back kid, and got yeah. inspired. I wonder, is that part of your creative process? Like, I believe that we are most creative when we're not trying to be. Is that what you were saying in that post? 
Yeah. So the, the context there, that was, that was something I posted last night, actually, funny enough. I was working on a 8,000 word um, script for my podcast, Pessimists Archive. It's actually funny enough, just before we were talking, I was, I was uh, kind of going through and revising it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, these are long, they're long pieces. They're very complicated. And uh, I, I don't have, you know, I, I don't think of it as like writer's block um, because I think of writing less as a creative act and more as an act of assembly. Um, like it's, to me, it's about having all the, elements in front of me and then coming up with a blueprint of how they all go together and then just thoughtfully pulling them together so that you take all these incoherent pieces and you make them coherent. But sometimes you've just been staring at it too long and you are stuck in one way of thinking. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, you watch, um, you watch a little baby um, I have a 16 month old, um, and, you know, you watch a little baby and as, as they first start walking, they'll just like, they'll walk into walls and then they'll like hit the wall and then they'll back up and then they'll just like try the wall again. You know, they'll just like keep going because they don't understand. Yeah. And, um, and I feel like our brains will do that. We'll just get into one direction and then we'll just kind of keep pounding at it. And um, in, it, when we do that, I think that you need to walk away and you need to reset. I often find that I do some of my greatest breakthroughs in thinking um, when I'm not actually working, when I'm somewhere else, when I'm, when it's just kind of marinating in the back of my head. Um, and, and, and that way, you know, the thing is that I, I think good creativity, good creation is all about pulling together disparate pieces and finding a way in which they fit, right? I mean, like, that's what I, I just talked to this guy, Matt Ridley, who wrote a book called uh, How Innovation Works. And I asked him, well, how does innovation work? And he said, innovation works by um, collectives of people uh, building on top of each other's work, uh, right. you know? Um, and, and so um, you can do that with yourself too. But the problem is that sometimes we just, when we're working and we're like literally working, sitting down and working, we are just, we're slamming into the same wall over and over again. And you need to step back and, and let your ideas connect with other things that are entering your brain. You just sort of open it up and just let other ideas and other input flow. And uh, that's where I think you try to, that's where I find the greatest connections. And then I jot it down and then I get back to the computer and then I'm on my way. That's very interesting. Thomas Edison apparently mastered the art of hypnagogia, which was a, um, an induced state of napping he got himself into. I don't know if you know the, the term uh, we have it here. I think it's universal. When the penny drops, you know, when somebody gets something, when mm -hmm. the penny drops, apparently came from Edison, who used to be in this napping state with a penny gripped between his knees and a metal tray beneath it. And if he fell into a sleep, he didn't want to. He just wanted to nap. If he went to sleep, he would relax his body. The penny would hit the tray and wake him up. And when he woke up, he had this flow of creativity that he didn't have when he was trying too hard. Hence the penny dropping meme, stop trying too hard and the penny will drop the metaphorical popsicle, you know? <laughs> yeah, oh, that's funny. I, the penny drop is not a phrase uh, that's common in, in, like, um, uh, in, in America. So, uh, but, okay. um, but that's interesting. You know, the, the funny thing, right, and actually Matt Ridley had made some, uh, had offered me some anecdote about Edison, about how he tried like five, I can't remember what it was, like 5,000 different kinds of filament or something before he right. figured out, um, you know, which one would work. And, and, you know, the lesson there is just like, just keep going. Um, but, uh, but, you know, there, there is a, there's a funny downside to Edison. You know, I'm very fascinated by why people resist innovation. Uh, that's the, that's the, that's the topic of the podcast that I do, Pessimists Archive. And, um, and so, you know, Edison was a, uh, you know, is, is credited uh, if so many things. One of them was introducing a commercial electricity. And, the th and, and that's true. Um, Edison, you know, set up this, this kind of early power plant. But Edison had invested all of his money and all of his technology into direct current. And, uh, you know, direct current doesn't actually go very far. It's, it's, not, it, it's not actually the way that most of us are, like most electricity that we're all using is not direct current, it's alternating current. And, uh, and alternating current was championed by Westinghouse and Tesla, and they started building out, uh, you know, alternating current facilities. Mm -hmm. And alternating current turned out to be the superior technology. And, West, and Edison 
Edison actually uh, railed against that. He, he fear-mongered uh, about, uh, about alternating current, um, he putting out these just crazy things about how if, if you know, your home is connected to alternating current, then everything you touch is going to kill you. And it, it really created a ton of confusion in the marketplace. And the great mystery was whether Edison actually believed that, which I really just can't understand that he would because he was such a smart guy, or whether he just um, got so caught up in the potential losses because he had picked the wrong horse that his solution was not to change everything that he had done and get with the right horse and admit that he was wrong, but instead to just try to stop progress. And that's something you see throughout time or when there is an incumbent, which, you know, like electricity was moving pretty fast, but you could say that Edison was the incumbent because um, uh, he was first to market. The incumbent often will respond to something new, not by innovating, uh, not by trying to improve the thing that they do or understand what people want, but just to make things scary and just to make just to create fear. Uh, this is what the butter industry did to margarine. It's what the milk industry is doing now to oat milk and other alternate milks. It's completely ridiculous. And you know, the, the major lesson that everybody should take that by that is that it fails every single time. It fails. Edison failed at that. We don't have direct current. We, I mean, we have direct current for some things, but we have alternating current. The world is largely alternating current. You can't do that. You can't resist innovation like that. You can't stick your foot in the ground and say, I'm right here. Everybody else has to adapt to me. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Jason, how would you describe what you do to a stranger? I often think I can explain what I do to people who know what I do. But if I was to meet you a stranger on a plane and said, what do you do? What do you typically say to people when you describe what you do, which I guess is multi-layered? Yeah, it is. I actually have a really hard time with that. I, you know, I mean, it's funny. I, I just, what I do is is like long and um and there are like different elements to it so honestly if i meet someone uh, on a on a plane um i i tend to just minimize it as much as possible and then if they're interested they can ask me for more so i always just say i run a business magazine all right and if the, and, and it's interesting because sometimes people be like oh what's the magazine and other people you know just don't care at all and they're like oh that's cool and so um but but what you know what do i the way that i think about what i do is that i I inspire people to feel good about doing hard things. Um, and that can come in many different forms. That comes in the magazine that I make, that comes in the, the podcasts that I do, the speaking that I do. Um, you know, I, I'm very active on social media. That's not for fun. That's because I see that as an extension of my brand and a way to build audience. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that the role that I play in people's lives is to make them feel less crazy about tackling massive challenges. And, um, and so, you know, the, the audience that I have are either people who are in the middle of massive challenges who are, who I think are gearing themselves up for a massive challenge. And, uh, you know, they, they, those are people who are in, you know, they, they, they are self-motivated, but at the same time, it's funny, everybody needs, everybody needs a push. And I think everybody needs validation that they're not, wasting their time and they're not wasting other people's time and um and even something as simple as posting my kind of random thoughts about work as you you know as you would see on instagram um you know i find just the response to that stuff is tremendous because people just people get lost and uh, and 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 entrepreneurship and and anything that's like entrepreneurship is a very isolating experience and people um people need something inside of that bubble of theirs that just tells them that they're doing okay. Yeah, I think, I, I think when I look at your stuff, there's a lot of teaching and wisdom for life, what I would call it in there. My big thing's communication, and I do these communication masterclass events around the world. So communication, so studying you as a communicator, I feel the freshness of not just inspiration, but the wisdom and the angles you come at things through, I think is what would draw me to, and I signed up to your podcast and your newsletter because I love oh, your thanks. take. I love your take on on making complex things simple. I think is a superpower, especially for people in the business world and the political world who make complex things more complicated. Right. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's I appreciate that. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's you know it, it's funny. Um, I didn't 
set out to do this uh, or to be this. I originally set out to just be a reporter and then I shifted into being an editor and that was really just because that's where the jobs are in magazines. And I really, I bounced around. I was a local newspaper reporter. I worked at Boston Magazine, Men's Health. Uh, you know, I, 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 I spent a small stint at Maxim Magazine, that like, you know, kind of trashy men's magazine. Um, but the reason I made all those changes was because I was constantly just focused on what it is that I didn't know how to do. Um, you know, I didn't know how to communicate in this way. I didn't know how to edit in this way. I didn't know how to write a 3000 word story. I didn't know how to. And, um, and then I would find that by just going around and picking up skills, I was able to then apply those skills to new things that I found interesting. And that I constantly pushed myself to explore new opportunities, even if it wasn't clear what the value was going to be. Like, I didn't know what the ROI was on learning how to be a podcaster. It just felt like something I should know how to do. And now that I look back on it, I can see how the things that I do in my current role, which I completely stumbled into, um, that, um, that they came from very unexpected places. So like, what, what's, you know, how is it that I am able to pull a lesson out of everything? It's something on a lot that I'm always, you know, regardless of what it is that I'm talking about, I can kind of drive it towards some takeaway lesson. And, and the answer is because I spent a few years doing that at Men's Health. That's how Men's Health writes. Everything is very uh, service oriented. It's all, it, it's all about telling a reader how to use some piece of information. I hated doing that at Men's Health. Um, but the reason that I hated doing it now I understand is because I just kind of didn't care about weight loss tips, you know, or fitness yeah. tips. Um, but then when I found something that I did care about, and I realized that I, I had built this instinct to be able to see something and immediately extract a lesson from it, that, um, that using this thing that I'd learned in a completely different context and applying it to a new line of work that I was more passionate about led to something that was pretty great. And, and so, you know, my, my lesson for everybody, besides I always turn to lessons, my lesson for everybody is to just be mindful of the skills that you're building, um, you know, separate from whatever context they're in. Because those are two different things. You can, you can be at work doing something, but learning a kind of core skill that's completely transferable. You should always be aware of that. One of the big things I speak about in the communication side of what I do is I think the best leaders, communicators, entrepreneurs, business leaders are that because they have a very strong, clear why that they've identified early on, the why not being a product they're selling, but a problem they're solving. Um, what do you think your why is? I think you've maybe mentioned it already in some of your comments, but is that something you've articulated, got very clear about early on? No, the why you have it's, to what you do? no, not at all. It's something that I've really worked on and I have, I've been trying to put it down into as few words as possible for a yeah, while the best now. Wise, yeah. yeah. And, um, and it's, you know, it's tough. It's, 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 it's honestly, it's quite, it's quite difficult um, because, you know, like, like I said, I stumbled into this and but by what I mean by that is, is that I was, I was at Maxim and I was looking for another opportunity. And as it turns out, entrepreneur was looking for an executive editor, which is the number two at a magazine. I was really interested in being the number two at a magazine. And so I, um, I, you know, I connected with the editor in chief at the time and we talked and she liked me and hired me. And then nine months later, she left the magazine. And then there was an opportunity to step in as editor in chief. And at the time, because my background was in making magazines, I saw that as a magazine making job. And so I, when I got the job, I spent the first year really just thinking about it as how do I make this magazine better? And how do I help this brand define itself in a, in a new moment? Because uh, it, hadn't, it hadn't really gone through that process in a while. And then once I got it into a place that I was happy with, I started going out and like accepting interviews and people weren't talking to me as if I was a magazine maker. They were talking right. to me as if I was a thought leader in entrepreneurship. And, and that was uncomfortable. It was not a role that I was used to. And it took me a long time to adjust to it. At first I pushed back on it. Then my, my wife gave me this powerful piece of advice, which was if they want you to be a thought leader, then be a thought leader. And, uh, and I realized, you know, the only difference between someone who's a thought leader and someone who's not a thought leader is that the thought leader is okay saying they're a thought leader. I mean, there's like no other difference. And right. so I started inhabiting this role 
and experimenting, putting things out into the world, um, ways that I felt I could bring value to people, seeing what people reacted to and then adjusting to it. And along the way, trying to understand as I was doing it, you know, there's this, Reed Hoffman has this great line about entrepreneurship, that entrepreneurship is building an airplane on the way down, or like jumping off a cliff and building an airplane on the way down. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was doing a little bit of that by building myself. I'm like, what the hell am I? And, um, and what I came to realize is that the thing that I connect with the most and the thing that I'm passionate about the most, and also just fascinated with, is, um, is the process of change, is why people are afraid of it, how people overcome that, how people create change, how people create change in themselves. And that I have, a, I, I'm in a position to help people do that. And so, you know, I, I but what, what does that mean exactly? You know, as a guy who has, runs a magazine, has three podcasts, does a lot of speaking, um, you know, I've got a, I've got a book that, you know, as soon as I have the time for it, like everything else, um, you know, we'll, we'll start chugging along. And, um, uh, and, and, you know, and some other projects. So I honestly, I really do, you know, like I, I slipped it in 10 minutes earlier, you asked me something and I said, um, I, in, I inspire people to feel good about doing hard things. Like that, that's like a line I came up with two weeks ago that I've been like trying to, trying to work out and see if it works for me, you know? And then I, 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 I don't know. Um, I, I know that my, my, I know that my why is that I, I really love I really love communicating in my own voice and being of use to people. And I think that the thing that, that, that people need and the thing that I am most fascinated by is, this, is, 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 is how change happens. And, um, and I'm figuring it out like everybody else. I think that phrase that you used about inspiring people to do hard things for me felt instantly like your why and instantly what I felt when I looked through your social media coupled to this sense of an act of service that it's packaged in. In other words, I didn't feel you were doing it as a hobby or an interest, or I'll try this, or it's a passing thing in my life. I felt served by listening to you. I felt mm. helped by listening to you. And when you did interviews, I noticed, and you felt the interviewer wasn't making it simple enough, you reset it in a way that we would understand it because you didn't feel confident they said it in a way we would understand it, though that wasn't your job. <laughs> That's right. Thanks for noticing that. You know, it's, I mean, that actually comes out of an observation that I, I used to listen to, what, back when I um, had like a car commute, I would listen to uh, a lot of NPR and um, uh, National Public Radio for those not in America. And, uh, and they, um, you know, there are, there are a number of, I, I noticed this thing that the interviewers do um, which was very impressive, um, particularly when they would do like a call-in show. Like there, there, there were these call-in shows. And, you know, they're very intelligent call-in shows. They're not like dumb talk radio call-in shows. They're always about current events. And um, somebody would call up and they would make some kind of rambling point because they're, you know, they're not perfect communicators. They're just a random listener who picked up the phone. And then the host would always take what that person said and reframe it in a really constructive way that advanced the conversation and then put it to the guest and then the guest would respond to that. And I, I, I remember hearing that and just thinking that is a great skill and also just a great thing to be aware of that you, that if you are, if you are, um, if you have a clear eyed understanding of what it, of what your role is in any setting and also if you are serving an audience and you understand how to serve that audience and what that audience is looking for, then your job isn't just to sit there and like be a traffic cop. Your job is to essentially produce ideas on the fly and make sure that they're as relevant as possible to the audience. And so I listened, I just was listening to, I heard it over and over again. And I, and I just thought if I'm ever in a position in which I need to do that, I need to do that. I just need to be good at that. And so I, yeah, I'm always looking for those opportunities um, because that, I feel like, uh, you know, my job is to serve and create a good experience. That, that memory of the car journeys and the commutes that you did and you take away from that to me speaks to the awakening of this calling. To me, that's an awakening of a calling that you were having back then, that that stuck with you more than any other things that could have stuck with you, that that was your takeaway. If I ever get to do this, I am going to do this a different way to me is, is interesting about people that have a clear calling and track it by memories, but I haven't packaged it together yet. I've struggled with that a lot in my life of, 
I know I feel passionate about this, but I don't know why no one else does. No one else noticed that. What the hell's wrong with me? Maybe I shouldn't notice it either. But I find I'm drawn to it effortlessly when others don't see it. And I woke up to realize maybe this is to do with why I'm on the planet. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's a great way of thinking about it. And, and, and that's not how I had thought of it. I'll, I, but, I, but I like that. Um, and I accept it, uh, but I, uh, I'll tell you the way that I thought about it, which was that I've always had, and I think this has served me really well, I've always had a curiosity about how things are made. Yeah. And, um, and, and, you know, in particular, curiosity about how things are made within, a, within my own field. And, you know, I see my own field as, as a field of storytelling and communications. And so when I watch television, I am not just enjoying it for I'm, okay. I'm 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 constantly thinking about how they created this and the number of storylines that have been written into this and like which arcs are are completing and which arcs are not and when i listen to radio i'm, I'm thinking about how it's produced I, I mean i'm just i'm always always alert to the skill that's involved in producing the thing that i'm consuming because you know that's how i learned to write as far as i'm concerned i, I don't have anybody who i Think of as a mentor, or 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 that I, that has served that role for me. Um, to me, my the closest thing that I have to like mentors were people who did really great work at a time in which I was young and most hungry to see great skill. So, for example, like Dave Eggers' books, um, I just I just dissected them. Um, and there's a guy named N.R. Kleinfeld who, um, who, who wrote a lot for the New York Times. Um, he still does, but not, I don't see his byline as much anymore. But far more, uh, you know, in like the early 2000s when I, when I was um, graduating college and, and, uh, and learning. And I would, just, I would just sit there and read what they did and then back up and say, okay, how did they do that? That was really funny. How did they do it? How did they lead into it? How did they, what was the transition here? How did they get from one idea to the other? And I just dissected it. And I, and I found that by being alert to the skills around you, you can start to absorb some of those skills yourself. Yeah, absolutely. What did you learn from The Rock? I saw you interviewed him. Oh yeah, I did. I loved him. Um, Any massive him, takeaway? Interviewed... Any surprises? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, so... The so I interviewed him and his his business partner, whose name is Danny yeah. Garcia. We, we, I put them on the cover of the magazine, um, I, and I I really I loved them. So first of all, everything that anybody's ever heard about how completely pleasant and nice they are, is was is just true. Is just very true. They they have a they have a reputation like nobody else um, for just being exceptionally generous and nice, and yeah. um, and that came through. Um, you know, the, the line that I will be repeating from that interview was they said, uh, I mean, Danny had said it, but she said it about both of them. They said, uh, uh, we are not attached to process. We are only attached to outcome. You know, they have an idea of where it is that they want to go and what it is that they have to offer the world. And they do not care exactly what it is that they do to get there. Um, and I don't mean that in like a bad way. I, you know, I mean that like they're constantly revising how they work, who they work with, um, the, you know, the, the, the products that they, that they put out. Um, Danny is very conscious about consci consciously evolving uh, Dwayne's, um, you know, work and persona in the world. And, um, and I loved that because it's true. You can't, you can't confuse process for outcome. You can't say the, the, the way I do something is also the thing that I do. Cause it's not, those are separate things. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I, you know, I love that their, their constant willingness to reinvent themselves, uh, you know, on the fly. I don't think Jason, I'm aware of your time, but I don't think that we grow. I don't think humans grow in environments that we have control over. In other words, to keep growing and flourishing as a human, I think you have to regularly, intentionally be out of control somewhere or intentionally create discomfort for yourself so that you see what happens. Curiosity will be, will be contributing to that process. I'm, I'm saying that to ask you, where do you currently feel out of control that is stretching you? 
Oh, that's, yeah, I, I agree with that. And, you know, and, and for what it's worth, the people who I've worked with, who I thought were the worst, <laughs> like just the worst at their jobs, the worst at interpersonal relationships, um, those were people who had rarely challenged themselves, uh, right. right? Like uh, many years ago, at one magazine I worked with, like, uh, he, was, he was very high up at the magazine and, um, and, and I had to work with him a lot and I hated it. And, um, and I consider him to be the worst person I've ever worked with. He was, he was rude and mean and not at all um, open-minded about what new ways we could experiment with putting things in the magazine. He had a very fixed idea. And, you know, it should not come as any surprise that he started as the mag- at the magazine as an intern and he had spent, you know, 15 years or longer um, just at that one place doing that one thing. He had never challenged himself. He had never had to rethink what he did and, and what his role was. And so, you know, that turned him into somebody who sucks. Uh, so um, where, how, where, where do I feel? I mean, I feel stretched in, honestly in every possible direction um, because I'm doing way too many things. Yeah. Um, so I, um, I feel like I don't, I feel like I haven't cracked the code on, on how to be me. Um, I know how to be the editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, uh, right? Which is a role that I occupy, and um, and uh, that I'm very happy to occupy, and that brings with it uh, a level of status and access. And that um, on top of that, I have built all these other things. But I am mindful that. I don't own Entrepreneur Magazine, and though I am very happy to be there now and will be happy to be there for time to come, I, you know, I'm not going to be there forever. And so how do I very crisply uh, define myself and produce the kind of work that people will turn to and not say, that's the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, but say, that's Jason Pfeiffer. Mm. And... Um, and I have so many conversations about that and am always thinking about it because it excites me. And it also, I think, gets, it pushes me to identify, as we were talking about earlier, the sort of core value, the core why. Because when you work a job, and especially if that job comes with some level of status, you, you know, you, there's a level of comfort that comes with that. You don't have to think about the why that much. The why is, it's just to fill the role. Um, but, um, but I don't ever want to lose sight of uh, that. I am not a role that I occupy. Um, yeah. I am in the long term a role that I create for myself. Yeah. I've never believed that we are the hats that we wear, but you are the same person under all those hats. But if you don't know who the hell that is, you default to the protection of the hat, which appeals to the ego and the egoic identity, and we live less and less from the soul, which I think great humans do, and live more and more from title and badges and roles, which protects the ego. I think what you touched on there is a huge issue. Um, One more thing to ask you about personal development Mm -hmm. challenges, which may be to do with what you just said, or all the frantic state of life you're in at this season. What are you doing? What's your greatest, do you think, um, I'm doing this, I'm working on me in doing this, a personal development challenge you feel. I wish I had more time on that. I'm frustrated that I can't get more attention to this about me as a human. Oh, hmm. I, you know, I mean, the thing that I, the thing that I struggle with uh, the most, and I don't know if this is an answer to your question, but the thing that I struggle the most with right now is, is, um, Build, like trusting others to do the work with me. Uh, I, you know, every, I, I obviously have a team at Entrepreneur. It's a small team and a great team. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so that, that, that's, that is what it is. But everything else, um, I do a lot of it myself. You know, I do too much of it myself. Um, just entirely too much of it myself. Uh, Right, I write every newsletter myself. I do every. I like. I run my social media myself. I write those eight thousand word podcast scripts myself. I, I, I um. I do it all myself, and um. You know, and I do that for two reasons. One, I'm very cognizant of my voice and the consistency of my voice, and that people, um, people connect with me, and I want it to be me. 
Um, but also, frankly, because I don't really know how to find people and build the kinds of relationships where I can find people who can help me. And I, yeah. you know, I do, I do, you know, I do have help in certain in certain places, um, right? Like Pessimist Archive, the podcast has a there's a there's a team of uh, there of sorts. But um, but but the actual writing of the podcast, which takes a tremendous amount of time, I have I just can't figure out how to find people to help me on it. And I yeah. and I think about it a lot. Uh, and um, you know, I, I had. I, yesterday, I had a long conversation with with a woman who helps people kind of build their personal brands, particularly by by kind of running their newsletters for them, like r- writing their newsletters for them and coming up with these systems and nurture, uh, uh, nurture some system. I can't even remember. She used the word nurture a lot, and um, and it sounds great, but you know, but I'm, then I'm always thinking, well, do I need to spend the money on this? How useful is this? Should I invest in this? Do I want this other person writing for me? Yeah. I, I, I'm really, I'm stuck. I'm stuck and I, and I need to figure it out because I, um, I'm stretched way too thin and that's a problem that needs solving. So is what you do scalable? Not, not, not the way I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> I've not the way I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's scalable, but it require, it'll require other people. It'll require, you know, it'll require going back to what, what, DJ and Danny said, which is um, DJ uh, Dwayne Johnson, uh, which is, um, he goes by DJ, is the, you know, the, um, we're not attached to process, we're attached to outcome. Um, and I need to, you know, I need to figure out what that, um, what that new, what that new process looks like. Uh, because I have opportunities. I have a book. I have, I'm co- having conversations with people for TV shows right now. Um, uh, something's got to give. Uh, and, um, and I need to figure, what, figure out what that is. Listen, how can our listeners find you? How can they track with you? Tell us what you're up to about what you are putting out there. How can we all find you? Yeah, thanks. So, well, you know, I've mentioned a couple of times, I'd love if you checked out the podcast, Pessimists Archive, Pessimists Archive, a history show about why people resist new things. Um, and then, uh, you know, you can find me on Instagram um, at Hey Pfeiffer. And, uh, and if you go to my website, jasonpfeiffer.com, you can sign up for my newsletter, which is called the Pfeiffer Five. And um, that's where it's, it's once a month nice and easy on your inbox. And, uh, you know, I share uh, the greatest wisdom I came across that month. I think everybody should do that. I think your social media is brilliant and I've began to enjoy it a lot. Looking forward to getting your newsletter, getting into your podcast. I want to thank you for your time, sir. I think you're a genius, whatever anybody else says. That's my opinion. I appreciate your time, your attention. I wish you all the best with that tribe that you're raising. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll need it. (laughs) Yeah, you will. You'll be fine. Uh, Well, yeah. Well, thank you. Hey, I appreciate you. Appreciate all your uh, your great questions and, and insights. Uh, it's been great. Thanks, Jason. Take care. Well, thanks again for listening to today's podcast. I hope you found it beneficial. And uh, I know time is precious commodity for us all, but I would love it if you would take the time to write a review or comment. And above all, maybe subscribe to my podcast channel. Thank you. <laughs>